we we define maturity as as leaving home. And of course, that's very problematic for the millennials because many of them are still living at home and many of them know that they're not going to have a home. Well, I'll be more careful. They're not going to have a house. They know that. Mm -hmm. My son is going through that right now. He's living with me. He knows. And he's like, he's working full-time high school biology teacher. That was used to be the kind of job that you could build a home and family around. And he's still living with his dad. And that's hard on him. This, this is part of it. There's a sort of a double whammy on these you know, on these kids because, first of all, they're not allowed to be homesick because of the cultural thing, but then mm-hmm. they can't fulfill the cultural thing because the culture is basically giving them the finger when they try to do it. And the filters are saying, oh, no, 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 you want to leave home? <laughs> not for you, right? And I'm worried that there's already a powder keg of resentment and then mm-hmm. these machines are going to disenfranchise, I mean, economically, even more people, and the resentment is going to become, like, murderous. Yeah. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to The Symbolic World. Hi, this is Paul. And as you can see from the other four people on the screen, we are going to talk today about the conference coming up in May, the Quest for a Spiritual Home. That's coming up in May 18 to 21 in Chino, California. Chino, California is about 40 miles east of Los Angeles. Chino, California has its own airport, the Ontario Airport in California. And so you can fly directly there. Tickets are available and there's a link below. But when we were talking about setting up this conference, um, as as you can see, Catherine is involved in this and Catherine set up the Thunder Bay conference. We very much wanted this to be um, in continuity and to continue the conversations that we began in Thunder Bay. And we had an offline meeting where we agreed on the topic, the quest for a, a spiritual home. And so I thought in as we move towards this conference, um, I think I thought it would be helpful to sort of continue the conversation online, which will sort of give us a little bit of a bridge to then getting to the conference. So some people noted that at the Thunder Bay conference, the the title of that conference was Consciousness and Conscience. And some people noted that we talked a lot more about consciousness than we talked about conscience. And so some people have suggested this will probably have us sort of fill out the card that we left unfinished in Thunder Bay. Um, So those of you who might not know who all is in the circle, Jonathan Peugeot um, is obviously here, John Verveke as well. Catherine was our moderator in Thunder Bay, and she will also moderate at in Chino. And John Vendank, who has worked with me a lot with the estuary program, is is located in Chino, and it's his it's his church that is um, giving us the facility to host the conference. And John is setting this up, and I thought uh, John would be an important voice because, in a lot of ways, a lot of John's whole life story has been a quest for a spiritual home. And and I would you know don't want to speak for John, but John and I have spoken about this a lot. That in, in in a lot of ways, John is still sort of a a restless wanderer in his quest for a spiritual home, uh, taking some time on the Camino pilgrimage in Europe, and he'll he'll share a bunch of different things as things progress. I thought maybe we would begin with Jonathan and John because I think both of them have been doing a lot of work that I think is is very much in continuity with the idea of a quest for a spiritual home. John, of course, has his After Socrates series, which has been coming out on his channel. Jonathan has been involved in the Exodus series on Daily Wire with Jordan Peterson, the kinds of conversations he usually does, and also a lot of travel. So maybe a way to get into this, John and Jonathan, would be for you two to sort of Give us a little update on what you've been doing and how that begins to prompt your thoughts on this idea of a quest for a spiritual home and 
what we'll be talking about in Chino. Either of you can go first. <laughs> sure, I can go first. Uh, and so, I mean, I think that the the idea of searching for a spiritual home is something which is it's a it's endemic to the situation of being a postmodern person of living you know in the suburbs of growing up deracinated i myself there are some advantages in some ways to being kind of a wanderer i grew up in several cities my parents moved a lot when i was young my, my you know i lived in the canada and the us and um and then i lived in africa as an adult and so in some ways i am an outsider just generally there's an advantage to that because you can also be a translator when you're an outsider. You can kind of, and Paul, you, you've noticed that in the what I'm doing is that in some ways I talk about the symbolic world, but I'm always bridging between the two. I keep moving between uh, the world of the kind of scientific materialist world that I criticize, but I move from that and I try to point people into a more embodied experience. But it means that I also have the same issue that everybody has, right? I have the same issue that most that I even I criticize about the modern world, which is, you know, I have the difficulty of being of feeling fully part of something and to be you know, kind of fully integrated into uh, into a, a spiritual home. And so, you know, becoming Orthodox, for example, was in some ways part of searching for that. But in order to become Orthodox, you almost also have to deracinate yourself and you you also have to be able to be willing to experience the strange and to and to kind of be able to you know tame a new world and 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 reintegrate a world that isn't obvious and isn't easy and so the one thing i can say about finding a spiritual home is that as contemporary people we have to be deliberate about it we can't it doesn't just happen you know like some maybe some 16th century village where you go to church you have the parish you've got your the priest there who's been there forever and you everybody goes to confession and everybody participates and you know what the celebrations are and you know at christmas we have this local tradition or whatever all these things are pretty much gone for us and so we have to be deliberate about it and so for for me in some ways it's difficult and it's and it's very it's hard not to still have alienation but it also makes whatever connection that I have very precious. And I, you know, I, 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 I grab onto it and I, and I feel uh, like it, it's transformative. And so I went to Mount Athos, as some of you know, in the past few weeks. And, uh, you know, that was a mix of those two things where I'm in Mount Athos, everybody, you know, I'm in church with people who are singing in Greek for three hours. And in some ways you just feel this weird, surreal experience of not knowing what's going on and not kind of knowing. Uh, but at the same time, I I was able to feel connected to to the Orthodox tradition in ways that I had never experienced before. And so I come back very much re-enlivened in my own practice, in my own prayer life, in my own faith. So yeah, so I don't know where I'm going, but I would say that's where I am. That's what you asked. Where are you? So that's kind of where I am in that in that uh, respect. So um, I am reflecting a lot on the quest for a spiritual home of all of three of the key elements, quest, spirit, and home. Um, so around home, I'm doing something that might catch you totally by surprise. I'm doing the cognitive science of home. Uh, what goes on there? What is this sense of belongingness? What's, why is it, how does it link up to issues of orientation, navigation? Um, and so um, I'm thinking about that and um, making use of uh, also uh, looking at some indigenous cultures um, who feel at home in the world without having housing. And that may help to bridge to what Jonathan was talking about. What is it like to be definitely, they definitely have home. They definitely have home without house. Um, and that's very interesting uh, because we seem to have the reverse. We seem to have houses without homes. Um, and by comparing and contrasting that, can we bring out uh, what it is home is doing for us? Um, and there's, there's, um, and, and I, I'm sort of building towards a proposal that 
uh, and this is built on something Jonathan said at the conference about, uh, he was talking about like um, meals and how they sort of level up. I'm trying to take how does, how do we exact up? And that's part of perhaps the spirituality. How do we exact up what you might call physical home um, into spiritual home? And what does, does what's, a, what, what's spiritual about that spiritual home? Um, and this has sort of two things. Uh, one is a, a broader, I've been making a broader argument. I did it at, uh, when I was at Ralston and I've done it really, I released that talk just yesterday, uh, the talk I gave at the Consilience Conference about leveling up and uh, about how the possibility of a deep or a strong kind of transcendence, which is not just psychological improvement, but the psyche is transcending and aspect levels of reality are being reliably disclosed um, and uh, arguing for that. Um, and I'm trying to mesh that understanding uh, and again, in, influenced by Jonathan, the idea of uh, faith as this sense of being able to level up, if I could put it that way. Um, and so I'm working on that and then what has been really consuming me for the last two weeks, I'm preparing a video essay for the end of the week at which this recording is happening on the scientific, the philosophical, and the spiritual significance of the GPT machines. And what do they mean for us? Oh my goodness. And all of those. And what and how that might intersect with our sense of uh, being at home cosmically. Because I, one of my things I'm going to argue for, I'm not going to argue for it right now, I think there's a deep connection though between cosmic at home and spiritual being spiritually at home. And part of the quest is how to weave those together and how to exact um, physical home into that. So that's sort of where I'm at and what I'm wrestling with. And it's, uh, um, and I, I got to spend uh, eight hours yesterday walking and talking first with just Jordan Hall and then with Jordan Hall and Christopher Master Pietro around this and i've been wor working on this as specifically uh what does what does it mean for us now that these machines are emerging and uh, and trying to cut through uh there's a lot of bullshit on both sides about these machines that have to be cut through uh very carefully and then uh we're going to face i think some reliable decision points and i think those decision points are really going to be bound to the normativity of home do we want to do we want to still have a home in the universe um as a question we we really I, I know that sounds like bizarre that we should even ask that question uh but we i'm gonna argue it uh, when we get to Chino we're facing that question so the quest is very much a quest it's not just the questioning question you know the questing and the questioning it's also the facing facing peril in really important ways. Um, and so that's where I'm at right now. John, Catherine, you guys want to throw anything in there? Well, I, I have given a little bit of thought to what I might bring to the table um, as a participant in this conversation. Um, I, I, I'm somewhat self-conscious in part because Paul keeps referring to me as the old man. I'm somewhat conscious of my age, and I, I would like to think of myself as representing the boomers and perhaps um, make some attempt to redeem the boomers. Um, but uh, the, the other thing um, that, that my life experience has pointed out is that there is no such thing as a linear trajectory. Um, it, it, the, in the long view, there's a lot of ups and downs and two steps forward and one step backward and three steps forward and two steps backward. And, and so there's that feature. Um, yes, I have some experience with um, a quest in the sense that um, I actually walked the Camino de Santiago, which is a, a traditional uh, pilgrimage, which was originally thought of in the olden days as a as a very much a, a quest to achieve a spiritual end and, uh, and 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 reach a spiritual destination, but it was also clear that um, for the Camino, at least, the the focus was as much on your daily 
place to sleep as it was the final destination. So uh, there is a there is a sense in which some of our focus on the quest for a spiritual home cannot be the final destination, but all the stops in between. And so that's one thing that I would like to focus on a little bit. Um, I would also like to contribute um, in, in some fashion. Um, I don't, and I don't really know where or how these things will all come up in, in our conversation, but uh, the fact that I've had a bit of a, a aha moment, uh, kind of a, a time in my life when something became particularly clear. And, um, and I'm kind of intrigued by what Jonathan said earlier about how, how um, this stuff doesn't happen automatically. You have to almost position yourself even for a, an aha moment for a, uh, a particular revelation. So I have a couple of stories that pertain to that. Um, I would like to have the opportunity along the way to perhaps say something um, on a more procedural uh, knowledge kind of line uh, about how estuary works. And that's of course something that I have been uh, busy with for, for um, several years now together with Paul to try and and figure out how to make that happen on the ground and what are the mechanics that actually make that come alive and make it work. So there are some procedural things that I would like to um, bring to the table. Um, there are some things uh, that I would like to say about my relationship to my rather conservative church and how it becomes in some fashion an anchor for my mental meanderings, my myopic mental meanderings, and that uh, it provides me with the a sort of a reference point from which to judge whether I'm still in touch with reality and, and what does it take and how did that church, you know, obtain the right in my life to, to be that anchor. And, and that is actually a story all by itself. And uh, so, yeah, that's probably some of the stuff that I've been thinking about, some of which may be meaningful in our conversation. If it doesn't all come up, that'll be fine as well. Okay. Catherine. I have a few thoughts. Um, I think at the forefront of my mind, I just think about um, the feedback we got from the first conference and how helpful people found it. <clears throat> I was talking to somebody about a month ago who watched through the series online. And she said that um, the, the word that described it most for her was luxurious. She found it to be emotionally and spiritually luxurious to just listen without feeling like behind every point there was this pressure to go out and now there's the 10 things you have to do. Like, here's a thought and now go forth and change the world and be a new person. But there was just room to really talk and really unpack and really work through and see people processing in real time. So I think at the front of my concern is the hope that we can continue that pattern to continue the um, really privilege of being able to take time to really unpack things thoughtfully and um, do it together. So that's my first thought is I hope that that pattern can continue. Um, my second thought is in line with what you were saying at first, Paul, that my thought in the initial conference was it would be nice to see how each of you consider consciousness differently, and then to see how that might lay itself out in a moral ethical pattern. So since this is what consciousness is, therefore what would your conscience lead you to? What should the ethical implications of that be? And I think that lines up really nicely with this theme of a quest for a spiritual home, because that's all very active. It's all very much instantiated. How do we do this? How do we live this? And um, again, it might not, Land was like, here's the 10 things to go do, but is there a sense that we can get of the pattern of how that might feel? Talking about rituals and rhythms and how do we go about this in a way, like John said, that's a process. It's not just where we land at the end of the trail, but the stops along the way. Um, so that's the second thought. Um, and the last thing I've been thinking is, since this theme came up, I've mostly been looking at it from the one side, you know, this idea that we want a, uh, a spiritual home, like a, a structure in which we can rest spiritually. But there's a flip side to that too, which means that if you have a spiritual home, you're going to be instantiating a spirit within it. And so I think a good question is what kind of spirit do you want to be patterning 
within the home that you're creating because it's this double-sided thing where you will create space um, for your spirit and other people's spirits to rest but you also are then going to be um, participating in some eternal pattern and so being conscious of what eternal pattern it is that we want to be instantiating I think that's the flip side of the conversation that I I hope we get around to at some point as well Maybe picking up on where Catherine left off, um, thinking about what happened at Thunder Bay. Now, John wasn't there, but the other four of us were. What what for you are you hoping for from this conference, either in continuity with or perhaps a pivot from? There will be paintball for Jesus. There will be paintball for Jesus, yes. <laughs> and it won't be raining. I I really enjoyed the conference so much in, you know, because there is something in we talk about home or talk about the sense of of uh of connection, you know, and I think that being in the same place together was definitely a great added value uh to 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 for the conversations to have a different flavor to them and so i really definitely enjoyed that so i think that i'm looking forward to a continuity of that you know and i think in some ways the the theme is perfect already like just the things that that uh, john verveki said i've got like it's just buzzing you know i wish the conference was tomorrow <laughs> so we can talk about all those things because it's just like there's in there's so much conver- there's so much uh there's so many things to tap into and to think about um so um so uh, by the way um I'm, I'm speaking to jordan hall as well about this question soon and we're going to do it more from the principality angle of it and mm-hmm. you know the question of of agency over us also this kind of these these patterns that act on us so so it, it all kind of ties in but i think that you know the um, I think that being in the same place will be very fruitful to 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 continuing these discussions Anyone else? I mean, I want to echo what Jonathan said. Um, I'm hoping for a continuity of the uh, like the spirit of that previous conference. So that was just, I, I think luxurious is very apt. Uh, that's how I experienced it. Um, and um, um, and uh, I felt, you know, we all got to places we couldn't get to individually. And for me, that's the criterion of success. Uh, and uh, I, um, I'm, I'm expecting, I think I'm reasonably expecting that's going to happen again. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that this topic does a little bit more of bridging to people who are not religiously oriented. <clears throat> I mean, we, we made, <clears throat> this isn't a criticism of the previous conference because it was a, it was a, a learning experience, right? <clears throat> but making sure that was one of the reasons we t- chose this title. In fact, um, we chose it collectively. All of us, we worked together to, it was a product of distributed cognition, you might say. Um, but um, something that would bridge uh, very deeply uh, between uh, people who are religiously oriented and those who aren't religiously oriented. Uh, because I do think um, that question is now, we being able to cross that divide so that we can meaningfully and deeply work together, I think is now even more pertinent than it was four weeks ago. Hmm. Uh, and so I think making sure that we properly tend to that bridge, um, I think is something I would like to see given a priority at this conference. I I, I also think one, one of the things that I very much appreciated about the conference was again to be in person i even though for many of you watching this the primary mode of connection you have with especially three of us is our images on flat screens and our voices coming out of speakers 
And you might, in fact, be listening to us in your home. You might be listening to us in your car. But the the opportunity, the opportunity to knit something else together. And and for me, as as we we think about how we will spend the time over Friday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in Chino. To me, a priority is to make a space so that more knitting together can be done. Not let's say, oh, you get a chance to do a selfie with one of the speakers, but you get a chance to uh, you get a chance to make at least. I, I like John uh, Van Donk mentioning the Camino. You get at ch- at least a chance to have a manse to to locate for a brief overnight with a group of new people and find out what that means in terms of the bonds and bridges and connections and growth that can happen in there. One of the one of the aspects to this is that uh, Grim Grizz tells me there are still 15 spaces available at the campground. So those who would like to camp for this, and truth be told, I'm not going to camp because I'm speaking and it's a little hard to prep for a speech if you're if you're kind of up to your up to your neck and other people camping. But part of me is, you know, really wishes I were camping because I know from from growing up church campouts and and camping with friends that that living together in in a way that we often only do when we camp outside is something that facilitates and prompts um, the kinds of connections that will, will, I think, facilitate the quest for a spiritual home. And even though, of course, you know, you get to watch myself or Jonathan or John on YouTube, it's the it's actually there's always churn with these these re, these sort of false relationships with screens you listen to jonathan for a while then you listen to paul and listen to john and then you're over here at this other channels and and the this is an opportunity to build some other relationships that are can actually go deeper and in my experience it's those friendships friendship relationships which actually transform us more than you know oh i listened to paul vanderclay for three years on youtube you know that's it's it's the face-to-face belly-to-belly nose-to-nose stuff and this is an opportunity for that and then the the overall speeches you know both what jonathan said and what john said already and what john and Catherine have already said you know that sort of teases me but i think that sort of opens up sort of the micro fissures in our in our settledness to allow new growth and transformation to take place. So, and I think we had a beginning of that in Thunder Bay, and I think we'll have opportunity for more of that in, in Chino. Um, I, I've sort of directed this so far, me asking questions, but I don't want to leave it in that manner. I don't know if any of you have questions or challenges or, or something you want to throw out to, to prompt this. I just thought it might be helpful to throw out the fact that the way the three of you have in the past few years uh, engaged in conversation with one another models a certain style and a certain openness and a certain towardliness that that's very admirable and and very enjoyable. And it it has that sense of lingering that Catherine was talking about. Uh, But we would like that model to translate into an underground experience also which means that it would be pretty much ideal if it could be orchestrated that a goodly number of people that normally hang out at John's channel or at Jonathan's channel would would also be represented um, at the conference so that there can be a little bit of a mixing of these three demographics, which I'm sure are a little bit different from one another and and kind of uh, symbolically uh, represent, you know, in which the three of you symbolically represent how three different ways of looking at the world and three different ways of talking about things can actually be practiced on the ground in Chino. That would be my super goal. And, and uh, I would be just delighted if, if that could be realized, which means that I would very much like 
uh, John, your people, and Jonathan, your people, to also come to Chino in the in similar numbers to uh, what 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 is coming from uh, from Paul's channel. So uh, I agree. That's great. What should I be doing? I mean, I'm going to promote this video on my channel and promote yeah. the conference. That may be uh, all it takes. That may be all it takes. Okay. Yeah, I, didn't I mean, want to, I didn't want to do it earlier because it. it I mean, it's, generally, I found you don't want to be that far from the event, or people just don't do much about it. They yeah. forgot. They just they they. I'll mentally file to do that, and then nothing happens. And they don't do so, it. But I think we're close enough now. I'm really happy to like promote this on all my platforms and promote this. And program. mention airline tickets. Mention airline. Mention airline tickets. What they get mean? more expensive if you wait longer. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> I'm actually. I, I I was supposed to get mine yesterday, but I was with Jordan, so I'm gonna. Uh, Taylor and I are trying to coordinate so we can fly in together. Taylor Barrett and I. Um. So he was also at uh, Thunder Bay. Um. So yeah, I'll, I'll yeah I'll scare people too then. Yeah. yeah. That, but for sure, the you know John to your point, uh, Van Dunk Van Dunk, sorry, the, to your point in terms of having all these people come together at for sure at the uh thunder bay conference it was amazing to see the variety of people that had come you know yeah. uh and it was it was very interesting and then also to notice people in the group you know create bonds with each other and discuss all across all kinds of of interesting lines and so i think we'll definitely see more of that in this, this in this conference and then i have a question from catherine catherine when you saw the tickets being purchased, was there a pattern among the people who paid for the tickets that there were just a lot of women who paid for the tickets, or was there, or were there actually a lot of women who showed up at the conference? I find a pattern right now is that I I'm, I, I I see the name of the person who buys the ticket, and a lot of them are female names. So either we're going to have a whole bunch of uh, women and girls at this conference. Or else they're buying tickets for their loved ones, and it's going to be a bunch of guys that are going to show up. Well, you want to speak to that, Catherine? What do you think is going to happen? Sure. Um, I found that there were quite a few couples that came, and so often the wife would, or girlfriend or partner would go in and, you know, um, sign up, and it would all be in her name. Um, <clears throat> and there were quite a few single ladies as well. There were quite a few women at the conference, and I was pleasantly surprised. Because I tend to think of our corner as being a little more nerdy and a little yeah, more male oriented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that more cognitive, thinky talky space and not as much of the hands on. Um, but there were quite a few women at the conference, and I'm really hoping a lot of them will come to this one as well because I really enjoyed meeting so many of them. We had a few women sign up for Paintball for Jesus. So be prepared, guys. We, we didn't have any women at. <laughs> In paintball and Thunder Bay, so oh really? So new. I did. I didn't remember if they were women or not. Yeah, so interesting. Well, it is. It is interesting to me how, um, how yeah, YouTube is a very male oriented space, but and I've noticed with our estuary meetings too, and here in Sacramento, more and more women have been coming, and it's it's interesting to me how. It's always interesting to me how they sort of reshape the conversation and the dynamics in the room. Um, and so, and, and I, I did notice that at Thunder Bay, that there were a good, per what percentage were women at Thunder Bay? Did you do run any math, Catherine? I didn't, but off the top of my head, I would have said maybe 30%. Yeah. It was quite a few. Yeah, quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's a, you know, especially given the, I really liked what I mean. This this home thing, John really sparked with awakening from the meaning crisis when he talked about domicile, and and John also this time when you talked about, um, you talked about those who aren't in. Those who are not currently let's see, language is harder. Those who are not sort of currently residing in a particular religious house, mm -hmm. let's say. And I, you know, I know people look at me and say, well, he's a minister, so he's doing this one thing. But, you know, as a as a minister, I most of the people I actually work with are sort of religiously homeless. Mm -hmm. And as you often mention, John, those those numbers of the nuns, that's been one of the one of the very interesting demographic realities. And 
And so this, uh, you know, part of what I think we've seen with the ongoing rise in globalization, um, affluence, transportation, is that many people, they are placeless. I don't know. I don't know any of us in this. You know, Jonathan mentioned he grew up in how many different places. I don't know how how many places you've lived, John. I've lived. I'm an immigrant. I'm an immigrant for starters. Yeah, the Dunk is an immigrant. Catherine, um, she's got a very interesting story in terms of growing up all over the place with a religious family. So I think, you know, especially seeing women in this context, women are, you know, women are often homemakers in many ways. Men tend to be distracted, foraging doers, and women are often centering. And so I'm, I'm really happy to see this, the beginning of what I think is probably more of a demographic balancing, I think probably a maturing of this conversation and community. Hope so. I know for sure that a lot of the people that come in kind of meeting crisis types that come into the churches, they end up being guys. And then you just have these crazy lopsided churches with like, like in my parish, that's what's going on. You know, it's, it's, it's all this like wave of like 20 guys, you know, like coming in and then just a few ladies. Well, so hopefully that balance out in general will balance out in terms of you know, people kind of kind of entering into these conversations. Well, maybe this brings up, a, a, I don't know if it is or not, maybe I'll be able to connect it. <laughs> but um, I'm also interested in, um, I'm interested in the, the other side of this. I'm interested in homesickness and how is that related to what's going on? I have the book, uh, not, I have not yet started reading it about uh, at the beginning of the, First half of the 20th century, homesickness was considered a major thing because of the rate of immigration into uh, North America, and it was taken mm -hmm. very seriously. And then there was a sort of cultural shift in which um, being sort of economically nomadic became uh, recommended, and then homesickness was looked on as a kind of weakness. Mm. Uh, and um, I'm what, interested. What book is this, John? Uh, if you'll. Um, pardon me for a sec. I'll go get it. Sure. Uh, that's, you know, I, I lived part of it, it, another interesting little facet of this corner. The first conversation I had with Jonathan, we dug into, you know, your journey in Africa. Yeah. And you talked about the fact that I didn't know you lived in the States for a while. Um, yeah, my father studied, he was a, he studied at, at Denver, Colorado at a Baptist seminary there. I forget what it's called. And then he, I lived in Wheaton. My dad was a uh, Wheaton grad school. When, when, oh, that's the title of the book. Yeah. Homesickness. Susan, what's, who's the author? Susan Jay Nat. Nat, an American history. Um, so this is not, a, a, this is not an analysis like of the phenomenon uh, like a like under unpacking its cognition or or its phenomenology or anything like that. It's an attempt though to understand um, why we shifted culturally from recognizing homesickness as a significant and real thing that people had to be helped with mm. to no 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 if you're homesick you're just immature you haven't grown up you failed to launch. And mm. my part of my, my I, I this is only a weak hypothesis, but part of I, the, my thinking is this is a contributory factor to the meaning crisis that we right um, is that people are in some sense experiencing domicide homesickness, but they're not allowed to articulate it that way, and so they're thrashing around in other ways of trying to articulate it, um, and so. Um, you know, and of course, this goes back to ancient themes of, you know, Augustine, you know, we're restless until we uh, find a home in God kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I'm particularly interested in the clash between these two normativities that seem to be both spoken about in our culture as if they go really happily together um, when, of course, they don't um, home and right and, and, and family values, the nebulously useless phrase, 
um, uh, because, you know, the Manson family had family values. Um, so uh, I, I don't know what that, yeah, it's it's dependent <laughs> on the quality of the family and the type of values. Uh, but uh, there's that, but then we, we push a culture um, that emphasizes, right, uh, like I said, economic, being an economic yeah. nomad. Um, and those two are like, and, you know, Ederstadt has made a, a very good argument in how the West really lost God is that it's the rise of individual people living alone is the most, the thing that is most powerfully correlated with loss in belief in God. Uh, take that for what you want. I'm not making a theological claim. It's just a straight demographic argument that when people lose extended deep homes, they lose a sense of why uh, a sense for god i'm trying to speak as neutrally as i can here yeah I, right and so i'm trying to also wrestle with how like we should we should recognize that these things are actually in a profound tension and they have a lot to do with people's uh spirituality um and you know that you know and this overlaps with the number of close friends people's has is reliably declining also each decade um and um so there's there's something here about um i think a vacillating unstable framing of home in our culture that is also a significant contributor to a lot of the other things we're talking about yeah but it's interesting because when you say home and especially you presented it home in some ways as part of the orientation mechanism yes you know, and right. so you know, and so what happens in it, it, even without realizing, you know, you have this value hierarchy, which says something like you go to college and then wherever you can get a job, right? That's where you go. You just move there and then you make a life there. It's just a normal, it's like a normal thing. You leave your home, you go to college, you maybe you find your spouse there and then you find a job and then you go to that place. And so that this is just a normal way of functioning uh, shows you part of the orient the orienting mechanism itself, right? What it is that that's making us make decisions, uh, and then the let's say the the downwind from that is a is a general destructuring of these intermediate not just family but just intermediary uh, structures of cohesion, like you know your clubs, your Boy Scouts, or whatever. All these things yeah, yeah. That the kind of hold thing. us together yeah, yeah. because the economic the economic vector becomes the only thing that really matters you know making money get, get, accumulating things yeah and and those things buffer us right and the, the the technical part the technical aspect of the thing that we have it's the they're all kind of extensions of each other right industrialization these computers these machines these things they kind of buffer us from each other and then they also become our orientating our orienting mechanism themselves uh, Glad you brought and the, that and the, uh, the, 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 the thing that you don't hear very often from preachers is, um, and I'm not really totally speaking as a preacher, but certainly as a person from a church perspective, is that if you find yourself in a church that seems like a good fit, a place where you feel comfortable, a place where things are said the way you think they should be said, and where the programs and the projects pretty much line up with your priorities and perspectives, then there is a good possibility that you may be in the wrong place. In that sense, yeah, in the sense of 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 a, of a kind of complacent, because a, a home is not, it's it's it actually, it, it's difficult, right? It's like being in con connection with your parents, your family, your siblings that have been grading you for your whole life. That there's been these little things accumulating. It's a difficult thing. It's not easy. Where these online communities are easier because it's all people. You know, it's like I like being with John Ravaki. You know, it, I I chose him as a friend. He's not he's not just someone around me that's getting on my nerves because they live in the neighborhood. You know, it's it's a different type of of uh, of reality. Well, well, this goes to a point that I want to bring up. Uh, I'll bring it up in my talk, but I'll also I'll foreshadow it a bit here. I think we shouldn't be talking about home in isolation. I I want to argue that there's a home horizon access axes instead. Uh, and that um, that is what we're trying to, and it, we even got it a bit with the quest motif uh, mm. in there. Uh, if if home is orientation and Stenberger, another not Stenberger, uh, that's that's the I got the wrong name. The guy who wrote the orientation book, I'll, I'll remember it. Uh, but if that uh, you know, if, if home 
tone is your original, not just temporal, but like an origin, like, yeah. uh, like an origin point on a map, right? If 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 home is your original, uh, your origin for orientation, it's but it, it it right. It also has to be in relationship to horizon, uh, in in, in an important way. Um, and, and it's interesting that home has this. I mean, this was part of what Brian Walsh was arguing way back when, when I met him on the train and read his article, right? That uh, home is also a place where we're, 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 we're it's a mach symbolic machine for worldview attunement. Mm -hmm. And it, it's designed to orient us um, uh, to, uh, to the horizon in some fashion. Um, uh, and so- You said, John, that thing that you just said, fits very well with the idea of the pilgrimage where there is a destination. Yeah, exactly. There is a destination and there is these different places where you can spend the night. Yeah. But the thing that is most reassuring on the Camino is those little yellow conch shells <laughs> that, that tell you that you're still on the right path. And 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 they 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 are noticeable from the beginning to the end and they give you an orientation of kind of where you're going. But they most definitely are not a place where you can spend the night because they're just a little tiny little, little marker. Thing. They're just a little marker. But but they are they are as a whole they are the most reassuring thing on the Camino. Well, that's exactly it. Like that's why I'm interested in the in the cultures that do not have houses, mm -hmm. and yet, uh, like uh, some of the Australian indigenous cultures, like they they you know when they have the dream lines and and such, um, and so they they found a way. Of, of of not being bound to this or that, but nevertheless, they have a way of orienting towards the horizon because yeah. they're all they're, they're they're moving around a lot, and um, I think that that's there's something to be learned from them. I don't know what it is yet. I'm still working on this. But there's there's definitely in the I think in most religious traditions there's a weird tension between uh, a kind of home and self alienation to a certain extent like asceticism can be understood as a type of conscious alienation and and i think jordan peterson really captures it in the ways he talks about it you know it's, it's like on the one hand you need enough home to give you that anchoring orientate orienting mechanism but you don't want too much because then you just you know you just kind of run around in circles and you you, you become too comfortable uh, and so you see ascetic practice and uh, pilgrimage is a good example seems and you see that in in a lot of the monastic especially the early monastic uh, authors where you know they went to the desert you know they 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 went out and put themselves in horrendous difficult lonely situation because they were they they could see the horizon they knew that they all, also has to, had to de-anchor de themselves in order to move towards the horizon and so I'm not saying that's what we should do. In some ways, now we have too much of that. Like we have too much de-anchoring and we don't have the the the, the stable or, orienting mechanism, but it seems for sure there always has to be a discussion between those two those two sides. Well, I, I'd like to bring that up too at the conference because I want to talk about the two great, the two, well, I consider them the two great home myths of the West. Mm. One is Odysseus and the return to home. And one is Abraham and the going to a new home, mm -hmm. and 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 you know the Greek and the Hebrew orientations there, and what does that mean? Because that's part of what I mean by the the, the home horizon polarity. You're it, it's it, it's 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 like this is Abraham going away from home to a new, and this is Odysseus trying to get back, right? And, and we have these two great, and, and so that's what I mean about I think when we're talking about home, we're actually talking about a polarity between. You know, like something where we are grounding and then somewhere where like this is assimilation and this is accommodation or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that plays out in the, you know, that our notions of the sacred also have that polarity in it. We talk about the sacred as that which makes us most at home, but then there's the numinous, right? That is also deeply horizontal. I don't want to say horizontal because that word doesn't mean what I want it to mean, but horizontal, right? Yeah, horizon. In, in a really, really powerful way. Um, and so, I mean, this is a, this is a way of saying that I think sacredness and the home horizon polarity are also deeply um, interpenetrating with each other in important ways, um, and that's why we we have these these. And it's interesting that the West has these two myths, hmm. uh, and it's holding on to both of them uh, in a profound, in a really profound way. 
Yeah. Uh, well, think about think about the the craziest image is obvious. I mean, to me at least, the craziest image is what's happening now. Like for me, we're in, entering Holy Week in the Orthodox tradition, and so we have this image of the cross, which is obviously the most alienated possible. It's like everybody hates you. Your people, the yeah. everybody, everybody's betrayed you. Everybody hates you. And then Christ is on the cross with this thief, and he says, "You know, today you will be with me in paradise." Right, he says the, that's home. Right, paradise is the home of homes. It's the place. It's the cosmic home. You could say the best way of saying it. But then he says that in a moment where basically everything that he can imagine is falling apart. Yeah. So it's like the, the, that that paradox is captured in a crazy way in in that story. Well, I want to pick up on that too. I mean, because Jesus in a couple of the gospels says he doesn't have a home. Yeah, this man doesn't have a home. Um, and so Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he is, uses son of man. You yes. know, that's not insignificant to that quote. Yes. Yes. I was you know, going to pick up on that, but it's, it's so it, it, and, and, and the Buddha says very similar things. Um, um, and so again, uh, it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm already doing what I want to do. I want to problematize this as much as we possibly can and then wrestle with it because yeah. <laughs> I think it is a deeply, deeply problematic thing. Uh, but I think it's also a deeply, deeply human and deeply, deeply needed thing. Mm. Um, and, and like I said, I'm worried that we're about to face something that is going to be as... If you took the invention of alphabetic literacy, the printing yeah. press and the telegraph and released them all at the same time, they won't make the same impact that these machines these new machines are going to make on us. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and the, the printing press is, you know, the Protestant Reformation, the religious wars, it's like, wow, it's going to be bigger. Um, so I, I like, I, I, I want to, like, I want to really wrestle with this really, really deeply, mm. like take it to its depths and crack it open as yeah. much as we can. Will people and, leave the conference in a panic? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I want. I want people to leave the conference with a, a profound sense of discernment that will allow them to address this. That's what I most want people uh, to have. Uh, and, and I don't think that answer is going to come from me. I think it's going to come from all of us and all of the people who come. Just like that's what came out of, like, that's what came out of Thunder Bay, right? It wasn't any one of us. Um, and I'm really hoping that I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of placing my faith in that our, the spirit will be able to engender there will give us some disclosure about how to orient ourselves right now. And yeah, I like we that don't, you we don't that. know. I don't know. Right. Like what is happening? I mean, I have my kids. They're young. So they, they're more they just it, they they're, they're it's seeping into them really fast. It's like, I don't use chat GPT, I'll be honest. I tried it for like 15 minutes, got bored with it. But my kids, they under, they can see like what this is and they intuitively just go straight to it. And uh, and so, and then every conversation, I've now every other conversation I have is is someone telling me about that. In church, in anywhere I go, it's that's what everybody's is, is talking about. And so I think John, you're right. Like this is what there's an explosion happening before our very eyes. And it's funny that I didn't, I didn't link it to, I was, I was thinking more about the problem of, you know, the problem of, of the relationship between technology and intelligence and, and, and how humans fit in that. But I didn't realize, or I didn't think about the question of home mm -hmm. and how in some ways it's it can blow us out of the, like it just blow up our, our parameters for what we consider to be, and even like what our place is, you know, because I didn't, because that's what it is. Ultimately, it's like, what's our place? Well, think, like, about, think about the irony, the enlightenment was, which was Promethean and said, no, no, human beings are all what history is all about in the telos. And now the enlightenment has betrayed us because it, it might put us in the hands of non-humans um, in a powerful way. And, 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 and the one thing that sort of tutored us about how to live with beings beyond us, religion has been undermined by ah, the ah. history. So we're sort of like, oh, um, right. Maybe we aren't ultimate. And um, oh, no. Uh, what do we have as a resource for dealing with that question? Well, stuff we've been taught for four centuries to not 
really believe it. And I'm not advocating a return to religion because I think this is going to have an impact on religion like the printing press had on religion. Mm. It, 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 religions are not going to be untouched by this. They're going to be profoundly challenged and I would argue even transformed by this. But nevertheless, we like th th this is in some sense, uh, I, mean, I, I hope I'm not misunderstood. I hope people will also wait before they jump on this till they've seen my video essay. But I think this is ultimately a religious question, these machines, yeah. Oh, yeah. in a really profound way. It's about what is our place in the cosmos and is it the place we have believed it to be for quite for several centuries, right? Um, so I really appreciate your um, your talking about it as a as a wrestling and an attempt to discern these different dynamics, and uh, it's going to be fall on in some degree on Catherine, I think, to um, find we we're going to have to together find some kind of a balance between the individual presentations that will be um, forthcoming from each of you. And then some conversations that will take place amongst yourselves. But uh, Paul and I have already talked about how we definitely would like to make room for people in their own small groups and conversation groups uh, to to be able to wrestle with these questions on the ground themselves, amongst themselves, and to kind of see a pattern emerging that they can do that um, henceforth. In other words, that this is not a one of kind of thing where, you know, we're going to go to Chino and we're going to try and solve all the world's problems, but rather that, um, we, you know, we, we, we not only have a sense of what are the issues, but we also have a sense of how can we process the issues along the way down the road. So that's going to be part of the goal, I think, for this conference. Uh, we have to make sure we leave enough time for that to take place. I think we have to give that a priority. I mean, I think... I, 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 we have to. I mean, I would hope that one of the things that comes out of the conference is people have a a, um, a guiding sense of what it is to exemplify being a, being able to feel at home in the world in a way that is not fantasy or uh, spiritual bypassing or all the other temptations that are going to arise for people right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, very much. Uh, like, 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 don't tell me what you believe. Tell me what you practice. We it, it's got to get into where people will see, realize for themselves in, in these groups, like what can they practice that will be like the best possible way of responding to this Kairos. I, I, am, I have no doubt that we're now in a Kairos. This is a Kairos, um, just absolutely pivotal. Yeah. Uh, when it could be, it's not crazy to say this could be the biggest turn in history. Um, uh, and so we are here now and we have to try and uh, we have to try and help people as much as we responsibly and best can. But you very much, John, I, I totally agree. I don't want this to just be talking about it. That's it, the time for just talking about these things is passing. Hmm. Catherine, you wave your hand if you want to get words in edgewise and I will, I will make sure I make space <laughs> I've got for a few you. words to sneak in. <laughs> um, <laughs> John, I really liked what you were saying about the need to complicate things first before we try to answer the questions. And so two two things were coming to mind as you guys were talking. One was, um, so the image of sort of Odysseus and Abraham, these two versions of spiritual quests. Oh, something that struck me is, now you guys can correct me, <laughs> But it seems to me that those appear to be more masculine versions of this quest. Mm. But the feminine version of the quest is how do you maintain the home, which mm. is a different type of quest. Even though you still stay in the same plot spot, usually, although not always, um, if you leave, it's usually the feminine role to reinstantiate the home, to rebuild the home. But often the story is there's a home to come back to, and usually it's some feminine element maintaining that space. Um, well, in Odysseus, that's clearly yeah. the case. Penelope is, yeah. <clears throat> she is a wise trickster, you know, holding off all these, these suitors and, and kind of actually making and unmaking the home, right? She's weaving and unweaving and she's kind of leaving the, the, the home in a kind of flux in order to prevent a new seed, like a new identity 
uh, of taking over. It's a pretty astounding imagery that's used in in, in Ulysses. Yeah, I, I, has kind of a unique role too in this same story. What? Well, who did you say, John? I said Sarah also has a rather unique story in yeah. uh, Abraham's homecoming. Perhaps yeah. not exactly as admirable as Penelope, but um, it's a story. Just well, well, Sarah and Rebecca are both under threat. That's true. Because, you know, it's interesting that Abraham sojourns, he's got to go into Egypt. And so, in a sense, Abraham commits domicide when he says, oh, that's my sister, in order to, in order, and I think there is a lot of domicide that happens out of fear of self-preservation. And, you know, one of the things, as you guys were talking to, there, there's a lot of class element in this. I often reflect, so I have a cousin who is just a few a few months different than myself. He His family was blue collar. My family was, you know, my father's a preacher. We moved around. He stayed put. He's a welder, so he works with his hands. I'm a pastor. I work with my words and my mouth. And and I look at the shape of our lives. He's in your hands. And my hands. I've I've lived in, he's lived in the same town his whole life. And, um, you know, that's, that's a piece of this, this too, that, um, you know, people, uh, I, John, I really, John Vervecki, I really like that, that, that homesick idea, because, you know, it seems like 30, 40 years ago, people would brag, well, I'm a citizen of the world. And in, in, a, in a way saying, I'm, I'm rootless. I, I get married on a pretty beach someplace. I, I dine with uh, high status people over in this area. And, and there's almost a, a, a flagrant celebration of rootlessness. And um, so I, I don't know, Catherine, if, if you wanted to continue with, with your point. Well, I, I actually want to jump off what you were saying, because that was, that leads into my second point. Um, when John was talking about um, the homesickness, the book that came to my mind was Andrew Sullivan's book, Far From the Tree. I don't know if you guys have read it. It's a, it's a fat one. Um, but essentially, it's a number of interviews where he talks with people. Um, he was a gay man. He grew up in a conservative home, felt very much like he was the fruit that fell far from the tree. Mm. And so it's a number of stories with people who are far from the tree. So he interviews um, criminals from families that aren't criminal geniuses, um, it, people with particular disabilities, particular abilities, anything that exceptionalizes them and separated them from their home. But what made that come to mind was because it's such a, I feel like that has become more the ideal now. It, so in the past you had the homesickness, you, you missed home, you wanted to be there. But now it seems like most of modern culture people are encouraged to define themselves in opposition to their home. Yes. And so being far from the tree isn't experienced as a, a hardship, although it may actually existentially be experienced that way, but we don't culturally define it that way. We culturally define that as your true identity, which is understood mm -hmm. in opposition. And I wonder how much um, that dynamic, if we could explore that and, and engage with that might answer some of this, uh, domicide that we have because I, I just see that as sort of the inverse of the book that you're reading, John. Yeah, I was very, thank you for saying that. Uh, I think you said it uh, better than I did. Uh, I'm very interested in that, that, yeah, we got this, we got this, in, we, we got the loss of homesickness as a positive and it's now become a negative, as you said, and we, in fact, we're, we, we define maturity as people, as, as leaving home mm. uh, in an important way. I, I think that was very well said. Um, and of course, that's very problematic for uh, the millennials because many of them are still living at home and many of them know that they're not going to have a home. Well, I'll be more careful. They're not going to have a house. Mm. They know they're not going to have a house. They know that. Mm -hmm. My son is going through that right now. He's living with me. And he knows, and he's like, he's working full-time high school biology teacher. That was used to be the kind of job that you could build a home and family around. And he's still living with his dad. And that's hard on him. I mean, 
Um, I try to not be here as much as possible so he can feel like it's his place. And Sara is very helpful for that. Uh, but um, but like this, this is part of it, right? Um, we we like. So there's a double, there's a sort of a double whammy on these on these kids because first of all, they're not allowed to be homesick because of the cultural thing, but then mm -hmm. they can't fulfill the cultural thing because the culture is basically giving them the finger when they try to do it. And the mm -hmm. filters are saying, "Oh no, no, no! You want to leave home? <laughs> not for you, not for you, right?" And, mm -hmm. and and so yeah, I mean, I think I'm worried. I'm worried that there's already a powder keg of resentment, and then. Mm -hmm. These machines are going to disenfranchise, I mean, economically, even more people. And the resentment is going to become, like, murderous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting. You know, we talk about transformation and and in, in oh, let's say, wisdom-oriented, you know, we, we, we want transformations. I, I think, John, that really gets into your both because you transform from something but that really much more gets into the horizontal aspect too, yes. because you want to transform into um, something that is, you want to transform actually into, you've talked a lot about this in your work, John, um, you know, who, who you are to become. There's that, that's, there's that second self that you talk yeah. about. And, but, but there is a, there is a necessary domicide that happens in transformation. Jordan Peterson, I think talks about that well too, in terms of, there's something that has to break in order for something to be reformed. And Jonathan, your point too about every Thanksgiving, one of the things that goes through the culture, especially sort of the uh, the Zoomer class culture, those of us who are citizens of the world, oh, I have to go back home for Thanksgiving. Oh, I have to endure my racist uncle or my, um, my henpecking mother or my um, withholding of approval father. And I mean, we have all of these cultural memes around this, um, the, the, very much a, a, an anxiety and, and even an anger in some ways with respect to home. And John, what John Verveke, what you just said, and then if you sort, sort of get trapped in home now, and, and this just just coming out of COVID, where, for example, I had three of my adult children, you know, back into the house for the beginning of the pandemic, at least. And so there's there's a lot going on in this space. But there, here's something that I, I like. Again, I, 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 I'm trying to not give away all the secret sauce. But yeah, they, yeah. For the for the conference. Tease him, John. Tease him. Save some. Be, be, because, I mean, there's another myth. There's the Odyssean and the Abrahamic. And yes, Catherine's right. We should pay attention to the feminine side of those myths. So that's a very good point. Um, but the, there's Plato's myth of anamnesis. Mm -hmm. That at, when you get the the most the most significant anagoge is also an act of deep remembrance. Right. And 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 that your 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 highest aspirational fulfillment of transformation should bring you into the deepest acceptance of your finitude and mortality right uh, and and so i th i think plato is wrestling with the tension that we're bumping up against here and he's saying it doesn't have to be like this tearing there is a way in which we can find right there's a way in which we both and this sounds like a paradox even to say it, we can reach for the horizon as we are gathered very, very deeply back into home. And that is also something that I want to propose as something we need to, is that? Yeah, definitely. I think it's great. De memory is, I mean, we talked about memory. We talked yeah. about that in our last discussion. Sorry, it's not online yet. So like memory <laughs> seems to be part of that More question. Teasers. Like, because I think of the story of, jo of Jonah and, and the fish, you know, how God tells Jonah, go, go here right so he's telling him to leave home and go to this other place uh and he he doesn't want to and then because of that he finds himself in death right he goes down but then when he's in death it's actually connecting the two together that makes it work he says i remember god i remember the holy place i remember the temple i remember you know the the, the this holy place which is his home spiritually and because of that then he's willing to to move it's like this idea that if you're connected in memory then you can go far because you don't lose yourself completely you 
you have this anchor and then you have the the capacity to see the horizon and and that reminds me of the psychological research around secure attachment right mm -hmm. that it's the per person who has actually the the child that is actually properly re religio to the parent that actually is capable of exploring and, uh, and when you're reading the adult attachment literature they 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 they're very sort of critical of the dependency myth you shouldn't be dependent on anybody but they're saying no 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 human beings actually explore most when they are deeply connected to somebody else mm. that is original for them in the way i'm trying to use it and so that is also uh like the, that to me is also uh, you know ho holds open the possibility that we have within us ways of being ways of becoming that can address this tension, this problematization that I've also been pushing on. I'm so giving away. I, too much. I feel like I'm giving away too much. Okay, right? so but then I have to tell you that <laughs> the whole question of home is pressing on me right now because I it's it's actually past the time that I should go back with my family and help with dinner and do all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> you know, the time got changed last minute, and I'm like, wait a minute, this time. So so I actually have to go and leave and leave all of you and. Uh, and uh, and give my last invitation to everybody who's watching this to uh, to come join us in Chino because I it's going to be a lot of it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, go ahead, Jonathan. I'll, I'll right. close out after you're gone. All you right, it's good much. to see everybody. Bye bye. All right, bye bye. Take care, Jonathan. Bye bye. Bye, Jonathan. No, I think I think John, you're giving us a um, you're giving us a real you're giving us some some good hors d'oeuvres in terms <laughs> of what we're going to want. Because when you start unpacking this, you begin to realize that this, I mean, quest, as as we talked about, quest is, it's not just a, it's not just a, oh, there's a destination here, I have to get there. Yes, it's, it's not just I'm a journey. Not, right. I'm not exactly sure of the destination either. And, but there's a, there's a pull and a push that, that are coming along. And we've talked about home. And I think probably as with Thunder Bay, we won't be able to fit all of the words in one short weekend, but yeah. you know the question is all the question is also going to be well, what on earth do we mean by a spiritual home? Yes. Because in this, I, I really like the language you gave it, John, in terms of it being horizontal, yeah. because that's going to sort of leave an empty space for for understanding spiritual. It's not just emotional, although it is that. Um, but it's orienting and it's active and it's moving, but it's also, you know, horizontal. I really like that word, John. That's that's really helpful. Um, just want to say that Solomon, Andrew Solomon, S-O-L-O-M-O-N, not Sullivan. When I heard you say that before, Catherine, I looked it up. Andrew Solomon, um, you, far Paul. from the tree. So any, any other, I don't want to have too much conversation without Jonathan here. But I don't, also don't want to truncate anything that needs to be said. I'm I'm not going to say anything more that would be valuable to other human beings. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hear some nothingness then, John. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I I uh, I feel Jonathan's lack very uh, very significantly. Yeah, yeah. So, um, any anything else? Any detail things? So this will come out on our various different channels. Ticket links will be below, and I'll share those with all of you to include with your um, on your channels as well. Um, there still are tickets still available. There still is camp sites available. Um, uh, the only crunch is I am not one hundred percent sure that Jonathan's trip to St Andrew's Orthodox Church um, can accommodate many more people because um, I, I think he's going to be addressing the group about the icons that are in the church and i'm not sure that it's easy to uh, move around with you know uh, more than 100 people in in that church yeah. and so I'm, I'm just thinking about the specific logistics i'd hope to ask them about that but that that if you really want to participate in that particular feature on sunday you better get you better get your name on the list so that's all i can say about that all right anything else anyone Catherine, you're 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 okay to travel to the United States? I think so. I don't think it's been lifted quite yet, but I'm sure it will. No, be no, lifted. today, today, today. today wow. He signed. So I'm good to go. He signed the thing that the emergency has been officially lifted. Perfect. Catherine is free to move about there. the country. Good. Well, thank you all for your time, and um, 
we look forward to get your tickets below. We look forward to seeing many of you at in Chino, California, coming up in May. Please come, everyone. It's going to be it's going to be amazing. I'm really excited to announce that we have just put up the new Symbolic World website. This new website, you know, marks the return of the blog, Symbolic World blog, the return of the reading list, and also a brand new Symbolic World community, which is accessible and will be hosted directly on the website. This community can be accessed by anybody who's subscribed to the Symbolic World. For those who are who were already subscribed and supporting us at different level of patronage, either through PayPal, Patreon, or Subscribestar, all you need to do is put in your email address. You will get a reset link for your password, and you are in. And for everyone, everybody else, it seems like a good time to join the Symbolic World to access all these new things. We're also offering a few new gifts to everybody who subscribes, even at the level uh, of free subscriber. Just to thank everybody for all the support you have given us all through all these years. And I have to say, it's just beginning. We will soon be announcing new courses. Uh, you know, Richard Rollin is preparing a course on Beowulf. There are all these new projects, the new Snow White project, God's Dog, and the SymbolicWorld.com will be the place to follow this and to get news and, you know, some... Uh, a few peek, a sneak peeks at what is coming in the future. So thanks everybody for your support. And uh, like I said, we're just starting.